also teach their plant-based eating class. Uh, it is a monthly support group and it was started by a cardiologist, Dr. Sanford Warren, five, six years ago. And I'm proud to say it is the number one subscribed group in all of Kaiser Santa Rosa. We have anywhere between 40 to 60 people uh, come out on a monthly basis. My goal today is to, t is to give you an introduction to a whole food plant-based diet. And specifically, what is a whole food plant-based diet? Uh, why should I adopt this way of eating? And how can I get started? And before I dive into these questions, I wanted to uh, explain why I am so passionate uh, about this entire whole food plant-based movement and why I can stand before you today and say that I truly believe 40 years from now I'm still going to be uh, saying the same message. I had a traditional medical uh, training. I trained at Boston University School of Medicine from 2006 to 2010 and after that I came out to Santa Rosa and trained at the Santa Rosa Family Medicine Residency uh, from 2010 to 2013. And during those seven years of med school and residency uh, success looked like this for me. Success looked like having a patient with type 2 diabetes uh, and helping them to bring their blood sugar levels to less than 150 with the aid of medications such as metformin or glipizide or in some cases insulin. Uh, success looked like having patients with high blood pressure in the 160s over 100s uh, and helping them to reduce their blood pressure to less than 140 over 90. Again, typically with the aid of med medications such as lisinopril or hydrochlorothiazide or uh, chlorothaladone or amlodipine. Uh, success looked like having patients with um, high cholesterol of over 200 uh, and helping them to lower their total cholesterol levels to less than 200, oftentimes with the aid of medications such as Lipitor or Crestor uh, or Simvastatin. Um, home runs in, 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 during my training were when we would help overweight patients lose 5% of their body weight. So someone coming in at uh, 300 pounds, okay? If we could help them lose 15 pounds, we would encourage them and say that this could imp improve your diabetes or improve your blood sugar levels and cholesterol. Um, and those were rare, but when those happened, uh, we celebrated. Uh, in contrast, uh, since uh, becoming a physician who practices whole food plant-based medicine uh, and helping people to change their overall health simply by what they put at the end of the fork, um, I have witnessed uh, nothing short of complete transformations. This is Robert Smith. Um, he gave me permission to use uh, his name and his picture and share his story. This was in 2014. Um, he weighed 298 pounds. His blood pressure was in the 140s over 90s, and he was taking multiple medications, Zetia, Norvask, Pristique, Albuterol. Zetia is a cholesterol medication. Uh, Norvask is a, blood a very powerful blood pressure lowering medication. Uh, Pristique is an antidepressant. Albuterol is for asthma. Um, and at his activity level, uh, he was sedentary. Uh, he said he would have too much pain in his joints, such as his knees, to walk very far at all. Um, these pictures were taken at a wedding that he and his wife attended and he told me that when he looked at these pictures he had reached that point where he said enough is enough. Uh, I can't continue on this way and he went online and did some research and essentially learned about a uh, whole food plant-based diet uh, and all the evidence uh, in favor of it and he decided to go ahead and try it. So this is him today. Wow. This is him three years later. Today he is 173 pounds. His blood pressure is in the 110s over 70s, and this is off all medication. He is no longer on his cholesterol lowering medication. He is no longer on his blood pressure lowering medication. Uh, he is no longer on his antidepressant, so his mood has improved along with his overall health. And he no longer uses albuterol. Uh, I had to catch him. This picture is catching him before he was about to go for his morning five mile run. He went from completely sedentary to first thing he wakes up in the morning going for a five mile run. I chose Robert specifically because this is not two months, this is not four months, this is three years later. This is change that is sustainable and long term. 
Uh, and if I had an interview of him and you could hear him, you can, you can sense that this is a permanent life change for him. This is not something, this is not a diet that he's going on and then going off. Uh, he is eating this way for the rest of his life. Uh, I took care of Robert Smith at True North uh, just a few months ago. Well, let's look at a patient of mine from the McDougal program. This is Josh Meyer. Uh, he describes himself as a Nebraska meat eater, okay? <laughs> the, these two pictures of him were taken in, uh, at the November 2015 McDougal employee program. And let me explain a little bit about the employee program. So Dr. McDougal, uh, who is a pioneer in the field of plant-based medicine and a mentor of mine who I'm extremely indebted and grateful to, um, he runs 10-day residential programs out of the Flamingo Hotel. People come from all around the world uh, and they stay for, at the Flamingo Hotel for 10 days and there they get medical care from Dr. McDougall and myself. Uh, they hear lectures from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and most importantly, they eat the food. They eat uh, starch-based, plant-based meals uh, free of uh, meat, animal products uh, and oil. And um, Whole Foods, for the last over five, six years, um, has been sending employees of theirs from all around the nation to the McDougal program. Uh, and the fact that they've been doing it for the last five to six years gives you a sense for how successful it's been. Well, CenturyLink, which is uh, one of um, uh, the largest telecommunications company in the United States, it's a S&P 500 uh, company, and they're the third largest telecom company after Verizon and AT&T. They decided a couple years ago, uh, in 2015, to send uh, their first uh, group of, of employees to the program. And Josh Meyer was one of these um, uh, people. So this was their first program, and these two pictures were taken of him at the program. Okay? He's a Nebraska meat eater. Uh, at this time, he weighed over 300 pounds. Um, and uh, he had that same moment that Robert Smith had after Halloween of 2015, where he said, I can't, I can't continue on this way. Uh, and the opportunity came up to come to the McDougal program. So he came to the McDougal program and he was still skeptical, but he decided to give it 30 days. And then at the end of 30 days, he decided to, to give it another 30 days. And then at the end of 60 days, he decided to give it a year. And uh, he sent an email with uh, his uh, story, um, and this is him one year later. Wow. November of 2016, so this is just uh, four months ago. Uh, he is no longer a Nebraska meat eater. He is a Nebraska plant eater. And he feels better than he has ever felt before. I never once in my entire seven years of medical school and residency training witnessed a total transformation like this. The closest I ever got was seeing patients who after bariatric surgery, maybe one year after bariatric surgery, lost a considerable amount of weight and came off a lot of medications. The sad part of the bariatric surgery story is that I've now seen many patients who are four or five years out from bariatric surgery and have not only put back on the original weight but are heavier, okay? Uh, not to mention the complications that I have seen from uh, many patients who have had bariatric surgery. So with that as sort of a segue, let's learn about what exactly is a whole food plant-based diet. Anyone know who this is? Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan, he's an author, he's a journalist, he's a food activist. He wrote this book uh, back in 2008, In Defense of Food, an Eater's Manifesto. And he is most famous for seven words. So first, eat food. Eat food that your grandma would recognize. So, Go-Gurts, right? Go-Gurts is not a food that your grandmother would recognize. Um, you want foods in, as uh, natural and minimally processed in, uh, as possible. Not too much, right? In the United States, we tend to overeat. We tend to eat till we're stuffed to the point that we have to loosen our, our belt buckle and unbutton our pants. Uh, so you want, to, you want to eat till you're satiated but not stuffed. And then lastly, mostly plants, okay? Um, and what does mostly plants look like? Well, it looks like this. The new four food groups in a whole food plant-based <coughs> diet are whole grains. So amaranth, buckwheat, barley, oats, rye, uh, uh, teff, which is a, a whole grain uh, from Ethiopia used to make the in, in, in era bread. 
fruits, all sizes, varieties, shapes, colors. Uh, vegetables, you're going to have your starchy vegetables and your non-starchy vegetables. So starchy vegetables would be things like uh, potatoes and sweet potatoes and butternut squash. Uh, and then your non-starchy vegetables would be your leafy greens, your kale, your spinach, uh, tomatoes, eggplant, cucumber. Uh, and then last, legumes, beans, peas, lentils. That's the bulk of a whole food plant-based diet. If you're deriving the vast majority of your nutrition from these four food groups uh, with maybe a small amount of seeds and nuts, uh, no more than one ounce a day, then uh, that in, in essence is what a whole food plant-based diet looks like. So if we just look at a few pictures, um, this is a bowl of steel cut oatmeal, right? This is my breakfast 85-90% of, uh, of all days. Um, I tend to use a mashed sweet banana as my sweetener, so I don't even add any sugar uh, and then top it with some berries. I had, I had this this morning as did my, my daughter, my son, and my wife. Dr. McDougall, they, uh, I'm in the midst of a, the March 2017 program right now, and just the other day we had um, the McDougal pizza, okay? Uh, and basically it's, it's a whole wheat crust, uh, no oil added, with, um, topped with all sorts of vegetables uh, and no cheese. This was my lunch last week I brought to, I brought to work. Um, barley, uh, edamame, uh, asparagus, um, bok choy, chickpeas, uh, pinto beans. Uh, this is a salad that I had the other day from True North, right? You see beets and carrots and cucumbers and, and bell peppers. Uh, this was my dinner a few days ago. A um, uh, mix of brown and white rice. Normally mine would be all brown rice, but you have to compromise as a father. And my five-year-old and nine-year-old need that little bit for now, so I work with them. So it's a combination of my brown and white rice, uh, black beans, pinto beans, corn, uh, uh, some bok choy, and some mushroom. This is a sample uh, plate from Kaiser that they uh, put out. Again, some black beans, uh, quinoa uh, as, your, as your grain, and as you can see, a wide variety of vegetables. And dessert, it looks like fruit, much less on the side of ice cream and cakes and cupcakes and cookies. Um, after a while, your palate adjusts and, and fruit becomes very sweet and a delectable dessert. So the question that I oftentimes get asked is this. What's the difference between a whole food plant-based diet and a vegetarian or vegan diet? Is, uh, is, this, is whole food plant-based just a really long-winded, fancy way of saying vegan or vegetarian? And the answer is they are very different. And I thought I would share some pictures to really uh, highlight just how different they can be. So if I was vegan, right, I could theoretically eat this in the course of a day and still call myself vegan. I could start off my day with Wonder White Bread and I can't believe it's not butter. And I could have four slices of that lathered with uh, I can't believe it's not butter. And that is a vegan breakfast. Now, of course, that has almost no fiber, so I would probably be starving by 10 a.m. in the morning. And so I'm going to reach for my vegan snack. And what better vegan snack than Oreos, right? <laughs> Oreos are a vegan cookie. There's no animal product in it. So I could eat 20 Oreos as my mid-morning snack and still call myself vegan. Now, by lunchtime, I'm really hungry because I've had about zero grams of fiber. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to reach for my vegan pizza that I comfort myself by saying that I'm using Daya vegan cheese, so that makes it healthy, um, and uh, french fries. And that's my, that's my vegan lunch. And then for dessert, uh, I'm going to reach for my bag of gummy bears, okay, which is vegan candy. And then I'm going to wash it all down with my vegan beverage, Coke. Now, this is only up till 1 p.m., right? And this is what I've consumed during the day, and I am vegan. There is not a single food up here that is whole food plant-based, okay? Um, even the french fries that are made of potatoes is no longer whole food because it's been deeply processed, right? It's been deep fried. So that, is really, that really captures to me the difference between a whole food plant-based diet and vegan, uh, veganism. You can have a vegan diet that is healthy, but you can also have a vegan diet that is very unhealthy. This is one of the other most common questions I get. How will I get adequate protein if I do not eat meat? And um, we don't need to look much further than the animal kingdom. Let's take the gorilla. This is from Forks Over Knives. No meat, no problem. The gorilla can lift up to 10 times its body weight. Right? 
The, the diet of a gorilla is 98% uh, vegetable, um, basically plant, uh, plant matter, right? Leaves, branches, uh, roots. Uh, they, they have 2%, 1 to 2% maybe that's caterpillars and larvae, but they are not meat eaters. And no one has ever looked at a gorilla and said that a gorilla suffers from protein deficiency. And if we look at other examples within the animal kingdom, right, the elephant, the bison, or buffalo, uh, horse, you don't look at these animals and say that they are suffering from protein deficiency. In fact, in my entire medical career, I've never seen someone in the United States that suffers from protein deficiency. It's just not something that we see. Uh, this is Frank Medrano. He is a uh, bodybuilder, a calisthenic expert, uh, and this is him today. And he uh, has all sorts of videos that you can go online and look at of just these insane demonstrations of muscle uh, strength and control. And you would not look at Frank Medrano uh, and say that he suffers from protein deficiency. This is what he uh, said about his diet. I thought I was healthy and strong before, but after adopting a plant-based diet, I started to feel energetic and I was having quicker recovery after training. The bottom line is you will get adequate protein on a whole food plant-based diet. Um, uh, the most recent example that I wanted to share is Tom Brady. He's a five-time Super Bowl champion now. Um, I just learned recently that Tom Brady eats a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, this is him pictured with his wife, Giselle. And he, as he describes what they eat, they eat 80% of their diet comes from those four food groups that we just talked about. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. Uh, and here you see Giselle uh, pictured with a bowl of, uh, of uh, soup with broccoli and potatoes. This is a picture of their daughter, Vivian, uh, slurping down a, a, green, a green smoothie. Okay, so I think you all have a good intuitive sense for what is a whole food plant-based diet, right? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants from the four main new, new food groups, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and grains. So this raises the question, why? Well, why should I go ahead and adopt this way of eating? The fact is, if, if America was healthy, if we were doing well as a nation, then there wouldn't be much need to discuss a plant-based diet. It would mean that whatever we were doing currently was working, but it's not. Two-thirds. So two-thirds of the United States is overweight or obese. Over one-third is obese. Uh, we spend, and despite the fact that we spend over 40 billion per year uh, on dieting and diet-related products, 95% of us regain that weight within one to five years. All right, so clearly what we're doing uh, in terms of dieting is not working. 50% of adults in the U.S. either have prediabetes or diabetes, okay? And that has just continued to grow over the years. One out of every two. 52 seconds. Every 52 seconds, an adult in the United States dies from heart disease, okay? I can't, this statistic keeps me up at night. I can't get over this whether it's a stroke, whether it's a heart attack. The total in a year is 610,000. In the course of this one hour presentation, 70 adults in the United States will have died from heart disease. And when we look at why this is the case, we don't have to look very far, right? Uh, on every street corner, we have uh, fast food, M McDonald's, Taco Bell, Burger King, Pizza Hut. Um, you check out of every aisle and you're met with a whole array of different types of candy. I was shopping at Best Buy the other day for electronics, right? And what am I met by is just a huge row of candy to buy on my way out. And I actually took a picture. I was at the Sonoma County Fair uh, last summer and I couldn't quite believe my eyes. See, now we've reached the point where a hamburger between two buns is no longer decadent enough. So we need to sandwich it between two Krispy Kreme donuts. This says, home of the Krispy Kreme burger, get it here. I had never seen this before, right? Um, and, you know, the fact that we've had two Krispy Kreme donuts, that doesn't quite count as dessert because there was a burger in between it. So you don't have to go far. You just go to the next stand and you can get your dessert of deep fried Snickers or deep fried Oreos or marshmallow pops, right? Because an Oreo and a Snickers bar is, is just not quite enough for dessert. We need to deep fry it to really, really bring it home. 
more than 50% of the American diet is ultra-processed. More than 50%, and to be exact, it's 58% uh, of the American diet is ultra-processed. So what exactly does that mean? I thought I'd read to you the definition uh, from the study that, uh, that performed this, in, uh, that was published in BMJ. Uh, so ultra-processed are formulations of several ingre ingredients which, besides salt, sugar, oils, and fats, include food substances not used in culinary preparations. In particular, flavors, colors, sweeteners, emulsifiers, and other additives used to imitate sensorial qualities of unprocessed or minimally processed foods and their culinary preparations, or to disguise undesirable qualities of the final product. More than 50% 50 per, 50 of what we eat comes from this kind of food. Uh, I wish I could say that the remainder was healthy plant-based foods, but it's not, right? Over 25% of our diet then comes from meat and dairy products, such as cheese, uh, steaks, chicken, eggs, right? Less than 10% of the American diet actually comes from fruits and vegetables. And most of that 10% is going to be things like fruit juice, right? Uh, or, or French fries, because p the, the potato would count as a vegetable. This book, Hungry Planet, um, the author and uh, photographer went around the world to different countries and they took a photo of what an average family in each of these countries eats during a week. Um, this is the Revez family um, in North Carolina and this is one week's worth of food for them. Uh, and as you can see, this is truly the standard American diet, right? We've got lots of pizza, uh, lots of meat, uh, we've got our instant ramen noodles, lots of fast food from the Burger King, K KFC, McDonald's, um, chips, sodas. Here's our 10% of fruit, right? So you've got some fruit juice here. Oh, and if you look really hard, you can see some potatoes and a, couple, a few bunches of grapes. Uh, we've got our Budweiser, our Diet Coke, lots of milk. Right? It's an ultra-processed, fast food, heavy in meat, dairy, American diet. And just contrast that with other countries around the world. All right? Not perfect, but just compare pictorially the difference. So if we looked at Egypt, this is the Ahmed family in Egypt. And just look at the colors, right? A lot more vegetables, fruits, you've got some bananas. Uh, yes, there is some meat. Yes, there's some soft drinks. But it's much, much less than what you just saw with the Revez family in the United States. Um, this is uh, Guatemala, again. Lots of fruits, vegetables, uh, they've got rice. Uh, this is the Patkar family in India. Again, same thing. You're, what you're struck by is a huge amount of fruits and vegetables, grains and legumes. Uh, the average American adult in the U.S. eats over 200 pounds of meat a year. And then contrast that with India where the average uh, uh, adult eats 11 pounds of meat per year. This is our answer to our problem. This is our answer to the two-thirds of Americans that are overweight, obese, to the 50% that are pre-diabetic and diabetic, uh, to the uh, patients with heart attacks that are dying um, every 52 seconds. It's pills, right? And if it's not pills, it's procedures. This is a uh, stent, and um, one of the most common procedures done in the United States is to put a stent uh, in w one of the vessels to the heart to open it. Um, Studies have shown that stents for chronic coronary artery disease does nothing to extend the lifespan. So it is purely a Band-Aid. And if not stent, then we'll take it a step further uh, and we'll do a coronary artery bypass graft surgery. Uh, we take a, a vein from the leg and uh, use it to get around the arterial blockage in the heart. All right? We'll have to crack open the chest, uh, do the surgery, and then sew it back together. So in this context comes a whole food plant-based diet. There is another way. And we could spend eight hours, 16 hours, a whole week talking about the health benefits of a plant-based diet. There is literature dating back um, to the 1920s showing the benefits of a plant-based diet. But here's just a few. Healthier weight, improved cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar, ultimately equating to less medication. Prevention and reversal of heart disease and diabetes, and I'll have more to say on that in a minute. Uh, may slow the progression of certain types of cancer, such as uh, colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer. And then last, improved symptoms from chronic illnesses, such as gout, rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and multiple sclerosis. 
And I thought I'd give you uh, just a brief case study that was recently published. Uh, this was a nutrition update for physicians on plant-based diet. This came out in the Kaiser Permanente Journal, all right, and was written by a number of doctors in uh, Southern California. Um, and they presented an actual case study of theirs. So, excuse the acronyms, but I'll explain. So it was a 63-year-old male with high blood pressure, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol, uh, who came in with fatigue, nausea, and muscle cramps, okay? This was an actual patient who came to Kaiser Southern California. He was on these four medications, lisinopril, 40 milligrams daily, hydrochlorothiazide, 50 milligrams daily, amlodipine, which is a blood, powerful blood pressure medication, five milligrams, and uh, torvastatin, which is a very powerful uh, cholesterol-lowering medication, 20 milligrams. At the doctor's office, he got a random blood glucose level, and it came back at 524. And just to give you a sense for how high that is, the cutoff for a random blood glucose level for a diagnosis of diabetes is 200. Okay, so this was off the charts. This was his new diagnosis of diabetes. Uh, hemoglobin A1C came back 11.1%. Hemoglobin A1C is an average of your blood sugar for the last two to three months. It's, it's yet another way that we diagnose diabetes. The cutoff for diagnosis of diabetes by hemoglobin A1C is 6.5% and here he was at 11.1%. So this represents very poorly controlled diabetes, and this was his new diagnosis. His total cholesterol came back 283, despite the fact that he was on a torvastatin or Lipitor, which is one of the most powerful cholesterol-lowering medications. His blood pressure was 132 over 66. Not bad, but again, he was on two blood pressure medications, hydrochlorothiazide and lisinopril, right? This is what I mentioned earlier. That's an example of um, successful control of blood pressure. And then his BMI, his body mass index, was 25. Uh, 25 less than 25 is considered normal weight. Uh, 25 to 30 is considered overweight. And 30 to 35 is obese. And 35 and higher is morbidly obese. So he's just at that border between normal weight and overweight. So what did the doctor do? He, as a good responsible physician, he started him on metformin. Uh, which is for diabetes. He started him on glipizide, which is for diabetes, and he started on NPH, which is a form of insulin, uh, 10 units for his diabetes, right? He started him on three medications for diabetes. Why? Because this patient was very poorly controlled and he wanted to get his blood sugars under better control. But he also started him on a whole food plant-based diet and advised him to exercise daily. So let's fast forward four months. Okay, let's just fast forward four months. Four months later, in terms of blood pressure, he was off the amlodipine. He was off the hydrochlorothiazide. He had decreased his lysinopril from 40 milligrams all the way down to 5 milligrams. And despite that, his blood pressure was lower than when he first came in. 132 over 66 down to 125 over 60. In terms of his diabetes, right? Remember, he came in poorly controlled. He stopped the glipizide. He completely came off the insulin, and his A1C went from 11.1% down to 6.3%. His new A1C did not even meet criteria for diagnosis of diabetes. In essence, in four months, he had reversed his diabetes and had come off of insulin and had come off of glipizide. All he was left on was metformin. And then finally, in terms of his cholesterol, he, dropped his, he did stay on the Lipitor, but he dropped his cholesterol from 283 down to 138. All right. And you can begin to see that the beauty of a plant-based diet is not that it just treats one condition, right? It's not like a, a blood pressure medication or a diabetes medication that just specifically treats that condition. This is the magic pill, so to speak, that you put on the end of your fork every day that treats all conditions. And this is a cartoon that I'll never forget. It was early on when I first learned about plant-based medicine. Uh, Dr. Dean Ornish, who is another pioneer in, in the field, uh, he gave a lecture at um, a plant-based conference in San Diego, and he started off with this cartoon, and it has stuck with me ever since. What this is, is a picture of two doctors who are mopping up the floor, okay? And if you look in the background, the sink, uh, the, the faucet is still on. It's just pouring water out. What this represents is the state of modern medicine today. We are mopping up the floor. We're mopping up the floor with glipizide, metformin, lisinopril, hydrochlorothiazide, stents, 
cabbage uh, coronary artery bypass graft surgeries. And meanwhile, we're not addressing the root cause. So as we're putting in uh, Krispy Kreme burgers, uh, as we're putting in the candy from the checkout aisle, the faucet keeps running. And so we're literally just playing catch up, okay? And what a plant-based diet does is it addresses the root cause. Finally, we are turning off the faucet so that we don't have to keep mopping up the floor. I wanted to focus a little bit on coronary artery disease since it is the number one killer of men and women in the United States and globally, right? As I mentioned, every 52 seconds, one US adult dies from this disease. This is uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn. He is a general surgeon. Uh, he practices at the Cleveland Clinic. And he became very disenchanted uh, uh, with the state of modern medicine. He felt like we were essentially mopping up the floor, just as, like that uh, cartoon that Dr. Dean Ornish presented earlier uh, showed. And uh, when he did the research, he came to the inescapable conclusion that a whole food plant-based diet was the solution. And so what he did is he solicited, he went to the cardiology department at the Cleveland Clinic and asked them to send him their uh, most difficult, challenging patients with heart disease. Okay. And they sent him uh, 18 patients who in the eight years before he started his study suffered 49 coronary events. These patients were very sick. Uh, in the eight years leading up to the start of his study, they suffered a total of 49 coronary events. 49 coronary events in 18 patients, right? Um, that's an average of almost between two to three events. Um, and these events included things like increased angina or worsening chest pain, uh, angiographic disease progression, so progression of the blockages of their coronary arteries, bypass surgery, um, infarctions or heart attacks, strokes, angioplasty, that procedure I mentioned earlier, where we put a stent in the arteries to the heart to open it up, or worsening stress test. Uh, people who uh, were put on uh, treadmills and were evaluated for how much, the, what their exercise capacity was. Um, and he put them on a simple study intervention, a, a diet consisting exclusively of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and lentils, uh, while at the same time excluding all meat, dairy, and oil. And he followed these 18 individuals for 12 years after the study was done. And remember, right, 48 coronary events in the eight years leading up to it. In the 12 years following, zero. Zero coronary events. Most people would expect that many of them would have died uh, or certainly that they would have at least the same number of events, if not more, okay? And instead, all but one. One patient uh, died of an arrhythmia at the five-year mark, but 12 years later, 17 patients still alive with zero coronary events. And if we look at actual imaging, this was from one of the patients. Uh, this is the angiography done in November of 1996. What you see here, distal LAD stands for the distal left anterior descending artery. It's one of the main arteries of the heart. Uh, you can see it's nice and open, and then right here at the end of it, it gets very narrow. Okay. In a repeat angiography done three years later, this is what it looks like. Right? It has just opened wide up. Uh, and really what this shows is that you cannot just keep, it, keep these lesions stable. You can actually reverse the heart disease. You can reverse the blockages in the arteries of your heart. Uh, just another image. This is a nuclear scan. And what you're looking at here is sort of a, a cross-sectional view of the main uh, chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. And the way to understand this is the red areas represent areas of good blood flow. And these sort of yellow, greenish, darkish areas, that represents areas of the heart that are not getting good blood flow, okay? This image was done just three weeks into the study for one of the patients. As you can see, look at this, nice good blood flow almost surrounding the entire heart. Well, right around this same time, Dr. Dean Ornish, who is yet another pioneer, and I mentioned earlier the cartoon that he showed, um, he was doing a, a similar kind of study, uh, at, except that his was a randomized control trial. So he took 48 patients, okay, and he randomized half of them to the American Heart Association diet. 
Uh, and these were patients with significant heart disease, anywhere from one vessel to three vessel disease. And he randomized the other half of them to a low-fat plant-based way of eating. In addition, he uh, did things like stress reduction or mindfulness. Uh, he did things like having support groups to increase people's sense of connection with each other um, and incorporated movement as well. And what he, how he measured progress was he looked at the coronary arteries again and looked at the level, the amount of blockage, okay? And um, here's what we see. So the control group, the group that was on the American Heart Association diet, right, getting conventional care by cardiology, their level of blockage in their coronary arteries went on average from 40.7% and then at the one-year mark to 42.3% and then at the five-year mark just continued to get worse, 51.9%. And then in contrast, here's the intervention group on the low-fat plant-based diet. 41.3%, they actually started off worse, right, with a greater degree of blockage than the control group. One year later, down to 38.5%, and then five years later, continued to go down to 37.3%. So again, what we see here is not just stabilization, but actually actual reversal of heart disease. Uh, furthermore, there was a 91% decrease in the frequency and severity of angina or chest pain attacks in the, in the uh, intervention group on the low-fat plant-based diet. And in contrast, there was a 165% increase at the one-year mark in the frequency and severity of angina attacks in the uh, control group on the American Heart Association diet getting conventional cardio cardiology care. And so it's for this reason that Dr. 